the SM7, be it that, you know, the capsule's like two or three inches underneath that, like, you know, foam that but the foam and the that cage that it's in it's like mm, it's like real right. industrial looking cage whereas right. the diaphragm for the re20 is closer to the top of the mic um ah that maybe would explain why the re20 seems to have a bit more top and bottom than the sm7 it, it, it could yeah yeah that, 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 that might be what sort of that, is more pleasing to your ears and i think other people probably like more of that like mid-range cutting through yeah openness yeah yeah I yeah. don't know. Teach their own, I guess. Yeah. And what, so, what's the difference between the the twenty and the three twenty? The three twenty is just a slightly different mic. Uh, yeah. It's got a bit more five K in it, and it yeah. has a it, it has like a little knob that you can dip out some mid range. So it's actually designed to be like a kick drum mic. Oh, uh, interesting. So you could you have like a kick drum mode, and you have like a like a flat mode, which is a bit more. It's a bright. It's more present than the RE twenty. It's got okay. like a nice. It actually works better on some people's voice than the, I was know, just going to say. It sounds like it'd be a perfect vocal mic. Yeah, it, it's a really good mic. Uh, I actually, you know, I did a live recording session um, where there were like, you know, there was like a loud acoustic piano in the same room as a acoustic guitar. Right. And and I just really felt like I needed dynamic mics to keep things in check. Right. Uh, for the vocalist and for the guitar he was playing. Oh, he was, I was also like, playing. The, the the musician was also singing as well as playing piano. Yeah, he was singing. No, the musician was singing and playing an acoustic guitar. Uh, and there was a pianist and a bassist. And I had to. I was like, I really, I need, to, I don't want to screw up the acoustic guitar recording, right? But there's a piano that's massive right next to it. I could send you a video of this af- uh, a- afterwards. Yeah. And. Um, so I just popped on the RE320. I was like, you know what? This is brighter than the RE20 or an SM7. This will probably get a better uh, SM57, rather, because I don't actually own an SM7. Um, this will this will be a better. This will be a good dynamic choice, I think, for the acoustic guitar, and it really worked. It was like because it had a bit more presence and like it, the acoustic guitar. Like you know, dynamic microphones on acoustic guitars can really sound dull, but this one kind of worked. So, That's cool. Yeah. 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 It was in, it was interesting. Yeah, I'm trying to remember. Yeah. There was. There was this one record. Oh no, that was banjo. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, there was this one record I did years ago um, that actually was like really successful. Um, it was like this um, uh, banjo um, and fiddle record that went went on to do cool. really well. Yeah, totally not something I, I typically work on, but it was really cool to work on it. And um, the banjo player was very persnickety about the sound, and we just were ha- we were going through every microphone I had. And, you know, trying to get the sound and um, he had some demos at home that he was playing me for like the next song we were working on or whatever. And I was like, oh, my God, this sounds so good. Like, how did you get this sound? And he's like, oh, this is my little Zoom recorder. I'm like, oh. <laughs> I'm like, can you go home and get it? <laughs> like, let's <laughs> use this. So we used the the Zoom recorder for the, the banjo recording on that record. It's like. Wow, yeah. just the H four, the H four N, or one of those. Like, I honestly uh, don't remember specific. I mean, it was one of those that yeah. had like the little X Y pattern microphones. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Those like micro pencil condenser stereo thing. Oh, totally. And we probably, I think we like ran it out of the headphones. It was all like impedance matched. <laughs> like we did not do it the way you were supposed to do it, but yeah, it, yeah. it sounded great and it sold really well. Like <laughs> who'd have thought? So cool. Yeah, cool <laughs> trick. Yeah, yeah. That that mic that mic has its has its place. It does sound. I don't know. I feel like just because I have that 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 Zoom recorder, yeah. There's something that sounds very like it's in real time happening. It doesn't sound good, but it sounds like you're there, kind of. Absolutely, you know? yeah. And you know, maybe it's just they've perfected that X Y thing, or I, you know, I don't I don't know what it is, but it worked, and yeah, we could move on from there after that. So cool. I love yeah. like random <laughs> ways of capturing stuff. I know. I kind of miss that. I'm you know just like working out of like this. Uh, you know, little bedroom studio sure. where I'm mostly, you know, mixing and doing like little productions. It's kind of, yeah, it's it's hard to open a big studio. It's hard to have a space to, you know, record all that stuff. I was doing, I, I used to do, uh, you know, remote recordings and stuff like that, but I kind of kind of grew tiresome of it because it's it's like all the gear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't envy that. Have you done Have you done any mobile recordings? Or, I have. That- yeah, I mean, uh, it's not. It, it, Yes, I have. I've done like voiceover work for that, um, where I worked with the Baltimore, um, uh, uh, the like Contemporary Museum of uh, the Baltimore Baltimore Museum of Art. Sorry, <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and I would record uh, interviews with the people there, 
Um, so I'd have to lug all my gear there. I did, I did do some stuff with um, a church that was hiring all these like amazing top tier musicians to do um, like a Christmas um, uh, show. That was that was a couple months ago actually. That was like the first time I really got back into it post COVID. And so it was this church that would do these huge Christmas shows. And, Mm -hmm. you know, because of COVID, they, you know, were not going to be doing these, but they still had paid all the musicians to do it. So they thought like, hey, let's bring these musicians in. And, you know, it's a gigantic space where we we were able to like distance ourselves and double mask and do it very, very safely. Everyone had to be tested. Like it was, it was pretty legit. Um, Wow. Cool. Yeah. I mean, it was nerve wracking, but luckily like me being the audio engineer, I could be like, you know, behind (laughs) a little bit. Yeah. um, And distance even more. But yeah, was it no, live? Was it, it a live stream or was it? Uh, no, was no, it no, no. Recorded? It was recorded, and there was like a whole video crew, and then like it was all mixed afterwards. Um, I just, I just tracked it. I just engineered it, and then Sean um, actually mixed it, and this other guy, um, Nick Hughes, who I've worked with before um, in a lot of other video work, um, did all the video for it. Um, but it, it just looked so spectacular, and but you know, it's a lot of like lugging a lot of gear around and moving mics around and it's it's a lot of work luckily it was a two-day shoot so you know i could leave the gear there overnight and it wasn't that big of a schlep for the second day but yeah 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 i mean maybe a good way maybe a good way to think of it is to think of it as like kind of like doing a pa gig where you're like like a live almost like being a live sound engineer it is yeah no it totally is you got to unload the you know you know load out load in all that all that stuff you know yeah and, and at the end of the day it's not like if I was recording a band, I feel, and I have done that before too, and I, I am not a fan of it. Um, mm. And and ninety percent of it is just the power wherever you're at is always just crap. Right. It's like you're always like <laughs> you're always like in a barn or a church that you know hasn't updated their electrical systems in like eighty years, and there's pops and clicks and hums and dropouts, and it's right, just a right, mess. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, I totally feel that. Oh, well, you got to send me that Christmas video because oh yeah, really it's, it's 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 amazing. Yeah, but that that's amazing too because you're not really doing like close miking on everything. You're sort of you know getting more room um, and a lot of omni microphones, um, so you cool. don't have to worry so much with phase. But um, yeah, it's totally fascinating. Totally fascinating so kept, to do that work. You've kept your mic locker and some of your you know, <laughs> studio stuff for this time of this post. Um... No. So that stuff I just borrowed from uh, my friend, Sean. Oh, nice. He does so more actually... of that. So yeah, we just traded off gear. Nice. So you kind of let go of all of the studio stuff from mom town. I did for the most part. Started afresh. Yeah. And which was kind of nice too. So it wasn't like, you know, I was looking at a piece of gear that I had in the studio and, you know, yearned for that studio anymore. It was like, it's sort of like pulling the bandaid off and starting fresh. So I don't, I'm like looking around at my gear right now, and I I think the only thing that I have right now that's something from the older studio are my Oblique Strategies cards and like maybe the the Furman power supplies. <laughs> that's probably about <laughs> wow. it. Yeah, cool. That that does that sounds wild, man. To yeah. get rid of everything and start over. Yeah, but yeah. It was definitely probably, cathartic. Yeah, I totally feel that. Um, do, you know. There are days when we all kind of go into the studio, you know, totally pumped to work. And there are days where we're kind of a bit more, you know, I don't know if I want to get up this morning. I'm kind of kind of tired. What do you do, you know, when you have those mornings where you're just not not pumped yet to get into the studio? Oh, man, I, I don't know that I have many of those days. I mean, unless I'm sick. But yeah, I mean, that's great. <laughs> yeah, no, I really like there's never a day where I don't want to be down here. Like it's definitely like where I want to be all the time. Um, it's like, it's a, it's a safe space. It's a comfortable space. You know, my kids will come here and hang out with me. Um, sometimes I have clients in here very rarely and obviously not now, but, um, no, it's, it's a great space to be in. And I, I, I love, I love coming down here and, you know, doing my work. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, like, you know, every once in a while, maybe I'll have an off day, but you know, I, I have the flexibility where if I'm not feeling it, like, I can take the day off, you know, I can, nice. I can juggle my schedule around and, you know, most of my clients are pretty flexible unless there's a hard date, you know, no sweat if it's an extra day or two. Right. Do you have any practices that you do like, 
you know, relatively often, like cons- with consistency that kind of keep you centered and focused? Um, <laughs> well, my, the, it's funny you ask that. My, my kids the other day are like, Dad, I never see you brush your teeth. When do you brush your teeth? Like, do you brush your teeth? And, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, well, now that you ask, I, I actually brush my teeth in the studio um, in the bathroom there. And it's, it's sort of a, um, I guess like a, uh, oh, such a good answer. <laughs> yeah. It's like my, my, my methodical thing that I do every day. Like, uh, it's my, you know, my process for starting the day and cleansing my mouth. <laughs> I, I don't know. Wow. I don't know why I do it. Um, but it's just something I do. <laughs> yeah. Well, it might be good for your teeth to brush your teeth after your coffee. You know, I don't know. <laughs> totally. Oh yeah. Oh man. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. That's awesome. Um, just a couple more questions. Sure. I think yeah. we've, we've t- touched on so many things. It's been really awesome. <laughs> totally. um, yeah. So, so Matt, you know, I have this, you know, I've, I've asked this question to pretty much every guest and uh, you know, kind of when you, if looking back on, on your journey, you know, when you were getting started, yeah. was there something that you did right? Or maybe was a serious mistake that you made that you'd want to impart on the listener who's maybe more at the beginning of their journey is, you know, this is a practice I somehow did right. Or this was something that I probably shouldn't have done at the beginning of my journey that, you know, would be a good lesson to learn. I think there's two things. And I think the first thing is always treating your client with respect. And, you know, regardless if you like the music or not, because a lot of the time, it's not necessarily music you would listen to. But you know, you're still there to do a job and you have to do it, you know, otherwise, you're not going to stay in business. So I think respecting the artist and um, communication, obviously, is huge. I guess that that plays in with um, respecting the artist. And um, you seem like you're a good communicator. I, I get a, I get the vibe that you, yeah. you're really good at communicating. <laughs> the with the you, irony with is, I, I feel like I, I don't know. I feel like I'm not a chatty person, but I just chatted with you for for two hours, and like my throat's dry, <laughs> and so I guess I am a talker. But um, there was something else. It's, oh yes, okay. So definitely communication, respecting the client, respecting their art, and and also just staying away from the drama. This 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 world that we're in it, it can be so dramatic and so high school and you know there's a lot of children in this in this business and just staying on top of it and not letting you know any of that stuff bring you down. Um, yeah, I just say like staying on top of your game and not being distracted by those mosquitoes. Yeah, being a grown up. <laughs> exactly, being a grown up. Yeah, and like just like you know. It can get so high school, especially, you know, in in smaller cities too, like Baltimore. Yeah, it's interesting. The whole smaller th- city thing is something that I'm kind of learning about now. It, like the fact that I'm in Jerusalem, it seems like if you want to like – Is Jerusalem bigger or smaller than Tel Aviv? It, it's So it's a bigger city than Tel Aviv but in population, but it's, it's a much smaller scene than Tel Aviv because huh. Jerusalem is kind of split up into three different cities. Like okay. there's – there's ultra orthodox Jerusalem. There's East Jerusalem, which is like Palestinian and an Arab. Right. And then there's like South Jerusalem, which is kind of more modern but Jewish. Okay. Um. So yeah. So it's a. So I would say the third that I live in is the you know South Jerusalem, which is more pluralistic and more right. kind of. I wouldn't say it's like Tel Aviv, but it's there's more Anglo's, more you know people from other countries as well. Right. Uh, right. More tourists. So it's a. It's a. It's a. I guess it's the the more diverse. You know quadrant right. of the city. Right. Uh but still that's already much smaller than Jerusalem as a whole. I see what you yeah, mean. So it's almost sense. as if those entities living they're like almost like in isolation. They're not even part of that city so to so to speak. Kind of. Yeah. I mean yes and no. It dep- it dep- I mean it's all it's all interrelated. But yeah. It's, yeah, it's an interesting question actually, but they kind of all live separate lives. Right. Yeah. You know, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Like I, I, I'll rarely go. To, I actually went to the ultra orthodox neighborhood of Jerusalem to get my vaccine. Oh wow! <laughs> and they've been known for flaunting the virus. I was like, Oh, I know. I know. <laughs> I told my wife, I told my wife, I'm going to get coronavirus just waiting to just, get this vaccine. Oh, no. It ended up working out. I waited outside, and then I just went straight in and whatever. But I know all the crazy but, stories I've been hearing about um, the ultra orthodox in in Queens and and Brooklyn, like having these huge parties and. Yeah, oh, it's so it's, it's, it's so scary. crazy. Yeah, the crazy thing is that we really are all 
interrelated. We're all in the same boat. And totally. I have no I have no doubt that, you know, maybe I shouldn't put this in the podcast, but you know, the <laughs> fact that my son my my son was exposed is probably directly related to these funerals. Right. I'm I'm guessing. Yeah. Totally. You know, where they flaunted the rule. Like it's what are you gonna do? Like we're all in the same I know, as, yeah. And my 